Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 25 through 31. <clears throat> this is a letter that was written to the Apostle Paul, to a church that he had started in a city called Corinth. And this is what he says. He says, Even the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, look at what you were when God called you. Not many of you were wise in the way that the world judges wisdom. Not many of you had great influence. Not many of you came from important families. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose what the world thinks is unimportant and what the world looks down on and thinks is nothing in order to destroy the, what the world thinks is important. God did this so that no one can brag in his presence. Because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. In Christ, we are put right with God, and we have been made holy, and we've been set free from God. So as the Scripture says, if someone wants to brag, he should brag only about the Lord. Pray with me. Lord, this day we, we came to brag, and we came to brag about you. Thank you that you chose to be here with us, not out of our goodness, but out of yours. And may, may we not let this opportunity pass us by. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Read a story about a fellow who needed a hearing aid, so he went to the hearing aid store. When he went in, he, he went to the salesperson at the front desk, said, how much are your hearing aids? The salesperson said, well, we have quite a few hearing aids. They go all the way from $1.50 to $25,000. The man said, wow, $25,000. What would I get for a hearing aid that costs $25,000? He said, well, this particular hearing aid is made in Switzerland. It has a lifetime warranty. Not only that, but it translates in three different languages. The man said, wow, that's impressive. But if, what do I get for a hearing aid that costs a dollar and a half? The man said, well, all that is, it's a button with a wire attached to it. You put a button in one ear and you lead the wire to your pocket. The man said, well, does it work? He said, no, not really, but you do that, you'll be surprised how loud people will talk. <laughs> well, the man said, hmm, I really need a hearing aid. So I'll spare no expense, $25,000. He bought the hearing aid and he was just so proud of it. Everywhere he went, he, he would brag about his hearing aid. He said, this hearing aid, that it, it was made in Switzerland. It has a lifetime warranty, and not only that, but it translates in three different languages. His wife said, wow, what kind is it? He said, oh, it's about five till 10. I thought that was the funniest joke I'd, <laughs> I'd ever heard. It kind of catches you off guard, doesn't it? But it lets you know, it, it doesn't pay to brag. Bragging will, it, It'll show wherever your weakness is. Ba bragging will end up biting you. And that's what Paul was dealing with here in Corinth. Oh, people were bragging. 
They were bragging. Those who were, had Greek origin, he says, you know, you have a long history of philosophy and a long history of appreciating the, the wisdom of those who've come before. And those of you who are Jewish, you have a, a long history, uh, the strength of your moral purity. As a matter of fact, it's known around the world that you, you have this, this code, the law of Moses. Cut it out. Stop it. That you, you're bragging to one another, trying to see who's higher and who's lower. And don't you know that it's, it's the, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisest man. And the, the weakness of God is stronger than the strongest. You go around and you start bragging. You start bragging, well, you know, I am a follower of Paul. And another says, well, I am a follower of Apollos. Another says, well, I've got you all beat. I'm a follower of Cephas. And stop it. He says, I didn't die for you. That was Jesus. Apollos didn't die on the cross for you, and neither did Cephas. That was Jesus. We all follow him. Cut out your bragging. And then he goes on to say, but if you do want to brag here in verse 31, he says, brag only about the Lord. Well, he didn't just pull that out of his hat and say, well, you know, that'd be a good thing to say. No, he pulls it out of the Old Testament. It was the prophet Jeremiah that said, if you want to brag, brag only about the Lord. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning. And the first thing that I want to talk about is brag about his love. Brag about his love. In the mid-1950s, Bennett Cerf was quite the celebrity. He's not what we'd call celebrity nowadays. Nowadays, most celebrities have to do something with sports or entertainment. Well, Bennett Cerf didn't have anything to do with either of these. Bennett Cerf was an author, and he had started Random House Publishing. He was an interesting person, and he had a great sense of humor. So very often, he would be invited for, on talk shows. He would be in on panel discussions. He would be at game shows where he could show off his sense of humor. And, and um, he was a very interesting person to be around. Well, NBC had a radio program called Conversations. I'm not real sure how well this particular format would go today, but what, he ha what NBC had was a panel, and the moderator would propose a question for the panel. And for 20 minutes, people would listen to the panel have conversations about the question, and at the end of 20 minutes, they would come up with, with an answer. Well, the moderator's question on this particular show was, what are people most afraid of? Well, immediately the panel jumped in. It was the 1950s, and communism was the first thing they said, and they talked about that for a little bit, and then somebody said, well, you know, the polio is running rampant, and it especially affects children, and, you know, if it affects children, that I think that's what people are most afraid of, and they talked about the polio virus for a while, and then they talked about nuclear annihilation. And at the end of the 20 minutes, the moderator did something that was curious. Rather than asking the panel, he turned to Bennett Cerf. And he said, Bennett, usually you're right in the thick of this and the conversation. I haven't heard you say a word today. And that's when Bennett Cerf said this. He said, well, maybe what I was thinking is kind of trivial. But I think what people are most afraid of is not being loved. Well, that's the first emotion mentioned by any human in the Bible. That God asks, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I hid for I was afraid. He was afraid of not being loved, afraid of not being accepted. If, if God had found out what he had done, then maybe he wouldn't be loved anymore. Maybe he wouldn't be accepted and I think it's not only Bennett Cerf and Adam, I think it's deep in the heart of, of all of us. Will we be loved? Will our, our love be returned? Will we be accepted if someone knew our flaws? Well, when Jesus 
sought to say the best thing he could about God. Being fully God and fully human, Jesus said, God so loved the world. That that's the most universal, that's the, 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 the broadest love that he could, could have, that God so loved the world. But he didn't just have a, a distant fondness that he so loved the world that he gave. And he didn't give just a little bit. He didn't give when as long as folks loved him first. Or he didn't only give if folks loved him back. That he gave his only son before you and I were born. He gave his only son. Now, I, I remember when the first time that I held my child in my hands, I looked down at that little boy and I said, I couldn't believe, I was overwhelmed. I couldn't believe my parents loved me that much. And then it hit me that as much as my parents loved me, God loved, loved me even more. And I was overwhelmed by that. And, and to think that God gave his only son Jesus went on to say that whoever believes in him. Now, God so loved the world, that's most general, but whoever is what's most particular. You could write your name right there, that whoever believes in him. And so often we think belief has to do with what goes on in our heads. That we, we think belief means that as, as long as we accept a teaching. So, you know, this person has a different belief than that person has a belief than that person has a belief. But that's, English has done that. That in English, there, there are two words where Greek, there's only one. And the Greek word here is pistis or pistuos, depending on how it's used. And, and the word for, for faith is the same word as the word for belief. It's just used a little bit differently. And it literally means to lean on, to rely on, to trust in, to have confidence. And, and you lean on, you rely on, you trust in a person, not a teaching. And that person is Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying, whoever will lean on, rely on, trust in him, have confidence in him, will have eternal life. That they won't perish, but will have eternal life. Now, so often we think eternal life is, is a few years tacked on after we die. But eternal life, Jesus tells us, it begins in the here and the now. That it's a quality of life, a texture of life that comes about in that relationship with him when we lean on, when we rely on, when we trust in him. That it's not our wisdom. It's not our strength. It's not our competitiveness to, to stand a little higher, a little lower than others. It's right at the, the, the heart of pride that likes to separate sheep from goats and say, well, we, you know, we don't have to be real good. We just have to be better than they are. And so we're trying to figure out who's higher and who's lower. But that's not the, the test. That what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me is he showed his love, his great love, and we can brag about that love that's not dependent on our wisdom. It's not dependent on our strength. It's not dependent on us being higher or lower than anyone else. It's dependent on his strength and his love. And you can lean on it. You can rely on it. You can trust in Jesus Christ. So brag about his love. Brag about his love. It's why we come together each week to practice bragging about that love. And so we sing songs of praise. We pray prayers of gratitude. We witness. We witness evidence of God right here among us in the here and the now. Brag about his love. Brag about his love. And the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is brag about his forgiveness. This is what verse 30 says. 
He says, in Christ we are put right with God. We've been made holy and we've been set free from sin. That's what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. He put us right with God. When he rose from the, the dead, he rose to live his life through us to make us holy. So we would be, be set free from the power of sin. And that's what Jesus does. It's not our wisdom. It's not our strength. It's not even our ability to be a little higher than someone else. It's not about competitiveness or, or pride. It's not about who's the, the sheep and, and who is the goat. Jesus does that. It's about his forgiveness. It's about his forgiveness. One of the best friends I, I have is Bob Christopher. We were friends in kindergarten. <clears throat> we grew up together all the way, went to church together, elementary school, high school, graduated high school. I was in his wedding. We still stay in touch. After he graduated from college, he, uh, he became a part of a ministry that had a radio program. And several years later, he wrote a book. And the book is called Simple Gospel, Simply Grace. And in his radio program, people call in asking questions. And then he and his team answer the questions that they have about the Bible. And I asked him one day, I said, well, what's the question that people ask most? And Bob said, well, that's simple. He said, the question people ask the most is, can I be forgiven? They understand that, that God forgives everybody, but they feel like there's something that they've done that's beyond the forgiveness of God. And they want to know, can, can they really be forgiven? Well, I started trying to, to think of an example of what that might be like. And I started thinking, imagine for a minute you go on vacation. And you're gone for two weeks and you've arranged with someone to cut your grass while you're gone. But what you didn't know is the minute that you left for vacation, that person got sick. He didn't let you know. He didn't call you. And he was well by the time you got back but what happened was your grass grew for two weeks and it's now about calf high you don't have a push mower that can get through that but you do remember that your next door neighbor without you even asking has offered offered you his riding mower he's got a, a brand new John Deere and he's offered you that riding mower and Now's the time that you really need it. And you know you need it. That that's the only going to be the only way you can get through it. And so you're, you're walking across your yard. It's calf deep. And you're thinking about how, just how, how tough this is going to be. And that's when the neighbor's dog comes to greet you. Well, it's a dachshund. They're cute. They're sweet. They're smart. They're all those things. But they are yappy and they do tend to nip and bite and those kind of things like that. And, it, and that's, this particular dachshund has messed in your yard more than once. And you're walking through and you're, you're kind of miffed that you, the, the grass is calf deep. And the little dachshund comes up and he starts to yap and bark and nip at you a little bit. And so you decide to punt him just a little bit. And that's when you look up. And your neighbor has seen you do the whole thing. Before you ask for anything, you know you've got some work to do. And in the church, that's called confession and repentance. You got to come clean. That's what it is. It's not just repeat a few words. You've got to come clean. It's not that... that that God is reluctant to forgive us is that we're reluctant to ask with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we're reluctant to come clean. So every week we come together and we remember what Jesus did on the cross. That he took all those things that would destroy us. He took the anger, he took the fear, he took the sin, he took the shame. He took all those things that would destroy us and he nailed it to the cross to take away its power once and for all. And when he rose from the grave, 
He rose to live his life through us to give us power over that. And so we come together every week to come clean. To celebrate his forgiveness, not to, to, to bathe in what we've done wrong in the past, but to change our attitude. To practice. Not our wisdom, not our strength to stay strong. Not our ability to be a little higher than someone else. But what Jesus did on the cross. We come to celebrate his forgiveness. Available this day. We come to celebrate that his Holy Spirit gives us strength over all those things that would destroy us. It's a practice. We practice bragging about his forgiveness. Not only do we brag about his forgiveness, not only do we brag about his love, but the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is we brag about his church. One of the things I enjoy doing is whenever people join the church, for a long time I've been asking them, well, how did you come to join this church? Not that long ago, I received the most interesting answer I've ever received. This fellow told me that he was on a business trip. He was flying from Boca Raton to Atlanta. He was coming back home after a long trip, and he said he overheard a conversation going on between two people sitting in the, the seats in front of him there on the plane. And he said the way that the woman talked about her church in such glowing terms and how much she enjoyed her church. That he said, I never thought I wanted to go to church. He said, I didn't go as a child. We never went. He said, but over the recent weeks, he said, my wife and I, that um, we had a baby. And we looked at that little baby and we knew we needed help. And didn't think about church until we heard this woman talking about this church. Well, you may think people don't listen to what you have to say, but guess what? They do. And it makes a difference. What you say about the church. It makes a difference. It makes a big difference that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world and the mechanism that Jesus chose to use is the church. That God has chosen to show who, who he really is through the church. People united in one body. People united loving one another. People united helping one another. People united showing who God is. The way that C.S. Lewis put it, he said, it's for that is what God meant humanity to be like, like players in one band or organs in one body. Here, in this church, every week, we join together to brag about what God's doing and to put our little with God's much, and, and because we do, 34 support groups meet here on this campus each week. Each week. Some of them leaning on God and, and, and one another to, to overcome the power of addiction because God has that power. Some of them leaning on God and, and each other going through grief. 34 support groups here on this campus every month. Over 200 families on the first Monday of the month come to receive groceries, produce, and household items that we've joined together with must neighbor pantries right here and, and the, the churches, Christians up and down the street that, to help people who really need help, to brag about God's goodness. That through the church, we're able to reach out and make a difference in the world to over 200 families every month. Last year, 93 young people made a first-time commitment to Jesus Christ here in this church. 
It wasn't too many weeks ago. I received a message on my answer machine. One of the women in the church called just to brag about her church. She called my answering machine and she said, I was at a gas station today. She said, this woman saw this, the magnetic sticker on the back of my car that says Roswell United Methodist Church. So this woman came up and said, do you go to that church? I told her, yes, I do. She said, your church kept me and my family from starving during COVID. We put our little with God's much. And we're thankful. We're thankful to be able to do that, to reach out into a world that this woman, her family wasn't able to get the school lunch program and, and feeding her children was something because there wasn't work for she or her husband. During that time, that this church, this church, we fed over a thousand people a month. So we brag. We brag about the church. We brag about what, what God's doing through you and through me together. This morning, it may be that when I began to talk about his love, that you had been bragging about his love. Instead, maybe you've been caught up in the same pride that the folks in Corinth were trying to figure out who's higher and who's lower and rather than bragging about God's love, you've been bragging about your wisdom or your strength. And it might be that God gave you a nudge. Or rather than bragging about his forgiveness, that um, you didn't know that it was available to you. That you sense that there's a, something that's separating you from God. Right now, this day, you can ask for her, his forgiveness. Come clean. Turn to him in confession and receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers. And I want to invite you to pray with me now. Jesus, this day is not like any other day. This moment is a moment where you're speaking not because we're wise or we're strong, but because you are. Lord, this day, we realize that we've fallen short, that we've gotten caught up in ourselves and knowing that we aren't, we aren't as the people that you made us to be this day. Jesus, we come clean. We turn to you and confess that we have fallen short. And Lord, I ask that you, you, through the power of your spirit, that you give us strength enough to change our attitude. And that we begin to brag about your love. We begin to brag about your forgiveness. And we begin to brag about your church. And in that, we be changed. That we'll be changed into your likeness as you live your life through us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at 
RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.